Hi everybody, my name is Tal Franji. Uh, I'm a Spark expert and uh, instructor. Uh, and I have a confession, I'm not a data scientist. You're supposed to say, we love you Tal. Okay, so, <laughs> so even though I'm not a data scientist, I'm going to talk about uh, TensorFlow. Uh, and not, the, not necessarily the data, the data science aspects of it. Um, I have to get used to this. Uh, okay, so the question I get a lot, I, I, I got into TensorFlow uh, six months ago uh, and I started uh, work, working with it. And th the question I get a lot from, even from data scientists is, does TensorFlow replace uh, Spark or big data? So actually, there's, there's no real direct relation. They both handle uh, scale, data at scale, but they are more compl complementary uh, technologies. Uh, so big data is about handling a lot of data, uh, which is either structured or semi-structured and discrete and sparse. Um, deep learning is about uh, handling analog uh, and structured data. Uh, uh, which is dense, either in, in, in terms of, of space or time, but it's more dense. So in many cases, uh, they are totally used for different applications. Um, now, deep learning, it, it seems like big data was, is the after the hype uh, term, like everybody are already in big data, all the banks, all the insurance companies, everybody is in big data. And that's how I uh, get hired to do Spark Consulting. Um, and deep learning is just beginning and everybody's starting to push deep, uh, deep uh, learning to everywhere. But actually it doesn't suit every application. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's the question. So if that's, that's the case, why, why, can, why, if, why, can we th why can we take things from Spark to TensorFlow? So I'll show what's the, the themes that are uh, similar. So, uh, in terms of, of operations, uh, normally you don't start your own cloud when you work with Spark. You've got some kind of, of a provider like Databricks or Amazon EMR. You don't start your own cluster. Uh, the same is true for, for getting into TensorFlow, deep learning. Mm -hmm. If you need a GPU machine, you normally need to either buy it or, in most cases, get it from a cloud provider. Um, you need monitoring. In Spark, I, I've seen at least half of you are familiar with Spark. In Spark, you have the Spark UI and accumulators to help you monitor and see what's going on. Uh, in Dataflow, we have TensorBlow, uh, TensorBoard and, and uh, uh, summaries. I'm, I'm tired too also. Uh, and in terms of programming, the paradigm is not trivial. So getting into Spark is not the same, programming in Spark is not the same as programming a simple program. You have to understand the functional model that's behind it. You're building a computational graph. In that respect, getting into TensorFlow and learning to program TensorFlow is similar. You need to understand the, uh, the construct that you're building using your programming language. And it's not trivial for most, uh, for most uh, programmers. Um, the use of, uh, of notebook. Uh, Zeppelin in the case of, uh, of uh, Spark and um, TensorFlow does not have yet a sub good support for, for Notebook. I'll show some support I wrote for uh, Jupyter uh, but it's not as nice as the, the Notebook support uh, for Spark. The cost is also a, a factor in, in, in getting it to, in, to both of them. In Spark, you have when you're running uh, when you're running a lot of uh, a lot of uh, executors, you pay by the hour to the cloud provider, and here you have expensive GPU uh, costs. And in terms of languages, Spark is Scala or Java backend, and you can't program it uh, using Python. Uh, TensorFlow, the backend is C++, and the frontend language is uh, is uh, uh, Python. Okay, so. When you start learning TensorFlow, the first thing you see in the tutorials is the, is the handwriting uh, MNIST uh, dataset. So it's a great tutorial, and it's, uh, if you want to start with TensorFlow, uh, go ahead and do it. But uh, for my taste, it's, it's too great. It's, it's too clean. It was engineered to work through all the steps and just work out of the, when you download it and you go through the steps and it works. 
when I, when I get uh, to learn a new language or a new platform, I try to invent my own problems to see where the dirty, uh, where the dirty sides are, where, what they don't show you in the tutorial. So I, I wanted to find a problem which is quite uh, similar to this, but my own. So um, I took, uh, I, I invented myself for an, an exercise for myself. It's an emoji exercise. I took 16 by 16 icon, same as the MNIST, and uh, I had this small data set. And what I wanted to, to do is a simple classification problem. Is, uh, uh, is the uh, icon I see, is it a emoji, a smiley, a, a sad face, a, a smiling face, or is it a different icon? So we have, a, a, I took a simple classification problem just to uh, learn uh, um, uh, TensorFlow. Um, the, the problem is, is quite sparse. We had uh, 68 emojis out of all this data set. So it's not a perfect data set to learn, but I, I learned a lot uh, going through it. So it, my first uh, tip or advice is when you learn something uh, besides the tutorials, try to get your own invent your own problems. Um, so here's the data set or part of it. Uh, and it, here's what we want to classify uh, to find the, the emojis. So I started, I'll, I'll not go to, through the code, but I, I started with a si simple regression-like uh, model. Uh, actually didn't give any good results uh, because it's just said, okay, everything is, the, the best bet would be everything is not emoji because it's very sparse. But I learned by running it, I, I still learned something. So running this on my laptop just took forever. It, it took running TensorFlow, it, it just never finished. It took a lot of time. So I said, okay, there's a problem. Uh, I probably need the GPU, okay? Uh, so I wrote myself a, a script, you can find it on GitHub, that allows me to do what I do with Spark many times. Every company I come from, uh, come, come to and, and start uh, consulting, I build them the infrastructure for the engineers and the data scientists to be able to start a cluster fast and uh, turn it, shut it down fast. Why is that important? Because the, the, cost, the cost of starting and a cluster or starting a GPU machine is a barrier for you to, to try things. If you lower that barrier, people will try more and it will cost you less because if the barrier is high, people start a, a GPU machine and then they go home and they say, well, tomorrow it would take me uh, half an hour just to define a new machine. I, I won't shut it down. And suddenly the, the cost for the companies for GPU machine being uh, up all night starts to, to rise. So uh, being your own, own DevOps, sometimes it's hard, but you can do it in Python. Uh, be your own DevOps, the, uh, um, manage your resources, manage your GPU machines or cluster, it's very uh, helpful. So you can find a, a small uh, utility on GitHub to start an, an, a deep learning uh, machine. Um, so what I, I, I did, I ran it on a GPU machine and what I got is that the GPU uh, is in 0% uh, utilization. There's a tool from NVIDIA which you can run on the GPU machine and it didn't do anything with the GPU. So my problem was not that my laptop was too slow. Um, so I moved uh, my, my code to using uh, batch, batches uh, of code. So this, is, did, this did something. Well, it started to work. The, the loss function uh, 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 started to converge. Um, and uh, this is also ran faster on my laptop. Apparently I did not need the GPU, right? If I was utilizing it for 3% on the GPU machine, probably do, I probably don't need the GPU. What I needed was to move to work in batches. So that's a lesson learned. Um, so um, my, my regression model did not uh, identify the, the emojis yet. Um, but what we learned is that uh, the, the GPU is not necessarily the problem. It's m more how you built the system. Okay, so the, what, what is happening? Uh, what uh, TensorFlow does is take the, the, um, the calculation, the NumPy model. Everybody familiar with what NumPy does? It does most of the calculation in C. It maintains the data structure in C. And Python is just a wrapper. When you multiply two matrices, 
It does it under the hood in, in C++. So uh, TensorFlow took it another uh, level. What you do in Python is define a full computational graph. And actually the full computational graph runs in C++ in the background, right? Uh, so the less you do with Python and the more you move to be working in C++, the, the, the more you gain in terms of performance. Um, so this is also something you need to learn when I told you about the, the program paradigm. You need to understand how to make the code work more in C++ and less uh, at doing the stuff in, uh, in uh, uh, Python. Um, when I moved the, uh, reading the examples themselves, the, the data from being read by Python and fed into, uh, into uh, TensorFlow to uh, using uh, TensorFlow inputs, uh, you can convert the data to uh, um, TensorFlow uh, propriety um, um, format, which is TF record. Uh, you get the C++ code to read the data, process it, and give you the result, and Python is not even involved in all that, okay? Uh, in one project I worked later on, we used Spark to take the data and convert it to a, uh, to a format that uh, TensorFlow can read natively, which makes the, the, the learning later faster. Uh, so you need to understand how the platform works be, be, uh, more than just understand your, your models or network. You need to understand what's working be, uh, under the hood. Um, so the, the next thing that helps you learn uh, most, most data science live in Jupiter, right? How many of you live inside Jupiter? Okay, so... Uh, um, Is there like outside Jupiter? <laughs> <laughs> some, some, some programmers live in an eclipse, you know. Is it like? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, so TensorFlow does not lend itself that easily to, to working with Jupiter. Um, but I, I uh, did some... Uh, wrote some utilities that will help you wrap uh, the things uh, needed for TensorFlow inside Jupyter. Uh, f uh, one, one thing specifically is that your session inside Jupyter will also start uh, TensorBoard, which, which is the visualization tool for, for TensorFlow. Uh, so again, the Sp in, in Spark, you have already a working uh, a notebook called, uh, called Zeppelin and a working uh, UI called Spark UI, which are integrated. Uh, TensorFlow is still not there, but I tried to do something with these utilities, which you can download. So um, you can play, uh, you can play with inside Jupyter, you can play with, uh, with, uh, with the uh, TensorFlow. You can run several uh, uh, learning uh, stages and see what happens. In this example, I'm op writing t uh, running uh, 100 steps for the optimizer to run, and I, I look at the loss uh, and how it uh, uh, decreases. Um, and you can also see the, uh, the, the loss going down in the TensorBoard uh, um, UI. Okay. The, the, it is very important to be able to play uh, interactively with the operators because you want to use TensorFlow's operator that are executed in, in, uh, in C++, you need to learn them and understand them. And there's no better way than interactive uh, interpreter. So playing in Jupyter and trying around what does uh, CONCAT do uh, is very important and that's why I, I encourage you to work inside an, an interactive environment. Um, okay. Tensor, TensorFlow has, uh, or TensorBoard has also uh, inter, um, summaries which are visual. Um, for example, you can, you can visualize the, the, the images you're processing, you can in, uh, visualize the um, weight metrics of each layer. And you can do that by, uh, by sending the images to TensorBoard. Uh, but sometimes you need to write code in TensorFlow that will uh, convert your weights into images. And you can do that, but you, you need to, to master that uh, piece also. Um, okay, so in, in generally use visualization. You can use a visualization that, you can use print, it's powerful. I mean, and don't hesitate to just print the loss or print whatever you want that helps you. Uh, you can use TensorBoard and you can just use uh, Jupyter itself with all kinds of, of visualization that help you. But 
from my experience, visualizing how the, the model acts step by step helps you a lot on the first stages. So here's, here's an example of, of uh, TensorBoard and the visualization I've used. It shows you the, uh, the, uh, the specific uh, icons it's, it processes, and this is the activation layers, the uh, levels of, of uh, weights in the activation layer. Okay, so what did I get from this emoji exercise in terms of uh, classification? Uh, so I didn't do a really good job because it's a very sparse uh, data. Mm -hmm. So um, I got 100% uh, recall and 78% accuracy. We'll see that this accuracy is better actually. And why is that? So this is the, this is the actual labeled emoji uh, for, for my, let's call it best model. Uh, this is when I use a single uh, uh, hidden layer, but it was too large. I was overfitting, and this is uh, a good uh, a, a good uh, result. So I didn't get all the the uh, uh, images. But what is interesting is that my model find this one, which is is not, was not labeled, but if you look at it, you can see it is an emoji. It was mislabeled. So if your model finds things that were mislabeled. It, did, it generalized, generalized in a good way, right? So for me, it was a magical moment to see that my, my model generalized and found something that was untagged. Um, so uh, th that's, that's my, my personal exercise. So to, to close it up, uh, um, use scripts to, to move to the cloud and work on, on a GPU machine. Visualize either in TensorBoard, either in TensorBoard or uh, outside. Play to understand the constructs of the of the TensorFlow, uh, and feel free to use my utilities to work inside uh, inside the Jupyter. That's all. I hope I've been uh, short enough. Thank you. Thank you.